I will turn my mic on and we will start this morning. Good morning. Welcome to Voyage Church. To all you moms out there, happy Mother's Day. We have special Mother Day donuts for you in the back. So we want you to grab one of those either now uh, or after our service this morning. We'll be fine. It might be hard to eat a donut while you're worshiping. So uh, check that out afterwards for sure. And uh, we thought about flowers, but we figured you guys could use some more sweets. So we wanted to offer you donuts instead this morning. So take those on your way out today. Um, Ivers, you have an announcement you want to make, and then we're going to move right into our time of worship together. Let's begin this morning with words from the psalmist who writes these words of praise. Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Who can list the glorious miracles of the Lord? Who can ever praise him enough? Let's pray. Father God, you are worthy of our praise this morning. And as we turn our time and attention to you today, may these words of praise be a blessing to you, God. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. How are you today? Sound, you sound fine. <laughs> That's good. Um, just wanted to uh, introduce a couple of verses before we uh, start our songs. So... Uh, I just want to read those. Uh, we're just in a time of, um, you know, we can be anxious, worried about different things, uh, worried about possibly COVID or government or, or whatever it is. It makes us anxious about the future. Where is our next paycheck coming from? All of that kind of thing. Uh, so uh, we're just going to read a few, few verses uh, concerning that. This is from 1 John. Um, God's love... Is, is, no, is not involved with fear. Perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it's for fear of punishment, and this shows we have not fully experienced God's perfect love. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Psalm 55, give your burdens to the Lord and he will take care of you. He will not permit his people to slip and fall. Isaiah 41.10 says, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be anxious. Look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So we have a great God that we serve, that we um, praise, that we worship. Um, so let's think about that. Let's cast all of those things aside that are bothering us and let's engage with him today and give him praise and glory and honor that he deserves. Let's all stand as we sing.
God, we want to rest upon you. As your word says, to cast all of our cares upon you, because we know that you care for us. You've shown us, you've proven it. And so we want to, to rest in you today. continue worship through prayer this morning, and we'd love to pray for you, and uh, we ask now that you would act upon each and every one of them. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled. Bye. 
Last, I was just thinking too, like last Mother's Day, we weren't even together, were we? Like we were virtual and uh, didn't have a chance to hardly even visit with moms and, and that sort of thing. And so today's a bit different and we can praise God for that. All right, uh, I'm going to pray and we will move into our worship time that parts that focuses primarily on God's word. And so we'll do that here in just a moment. Let's pray. Father God, you have taught us so much this morning already. You've given us a blueprint. You've given us a soundtrack even of what's important through these songs that we get to sing. And now, God, I'm confident you have something to teach us directly from your word today as well. Help us to hear your word loud and clear, I pray. Amen. Amen. So for years, I had it. And I drew great pride in the fact that I had it. And my wife didn't have it. Four out of six of my kids didn't have it. And I never really said it vocally, but I'm thinking the whole time, like, what's the problem? Why don't you have it? I have it. You don't. Well, that all changed this last week. If you were with us last week, I mentioned uh, an appointment that I had on Monday. And... I went to an eye doctor. Um, for years, I had it. 2020 vision, right? The eye doctor said I didn't have it anymore. 
The glasses have been ordered. But I took great pride in the fact that I had it. But it turned out it was not true at all. Now, this past week, uh, I read a book called Soundtracks. And it's from author John Acuff. Some of you are familiar with him. He's written some books. Start, I think, is one of them. Finish is another one. He's oftentimes affiliated with Dave Ramsey over the years, uh, but has since ventured out on his own. And uh, this latest book came out a couple weeks back called Soundtracks, The Surprising Solution to Over thinking. And so in this book, he talks about the soundtracks. And what he means by soundtracks are the thoughts that run around in our head day in and day out. And sometimes these thoughts can be super empowering, good thoughts, helpful thoughts that lead us down good roads and good pathways and that sort of thing. But other times these thoughts, these soundtracks that we're playing are not so good. They're not very helpful at all. And oftentimes they are either unkind to ourselves or they are untrue. Now I've already shared with you my soundtrack, my broken soundtrack said I have 2020 vision, but it was untrue. I don't have 2020 vision anymore. You have broken soundtracks as well that we'll talk about this morning. To kind of settle in and steer us towards this idea, I do want to take you into God's Word this morning, and we're going to look at a letter. And it's a letter that was written probably back in AD 65, AD 66, so a long, long time ago. And this letter is from the Apostle Paul, and it's written to his co-worker, who is Timothy. So if you have a Bible, we are in 2 Timothy this morning, and I want to read to you, to begin with, the first two verses. We'll read through verse 7 this morning, but the first two verses is where we will start today. And here's how Paul begins. He says, this letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. I've been sent out to tell others about the life he has promised through faith in Christ Jesus. I am writing to Timothy, my dear son, may God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord give you grace, mercy, and peace. So here we have an opening to a letter, not that different from other letters that Paul will write. Even compared to 1 Timothy, this letter starts out pretty much the same. The standard greetings between Paul and the person who is receiving the letter. In this case, it's Timothy. Now, what do we know about Paul and Timothy? We do know that Paul comes across Timothy in Acts chapter 16, and he sees Timothy who is at a young age, But there's something about Timothy that draws him to him. He has this upstanding faith for such a young person. And he's so impressed with Timothy that he calls Timothy to come along with him to plant more and more churches. And so it becomes that these two, Timothy and Paul, are co-workers in spreading the good news of Jesus Christ throughout that known world at that time. Now, I'd love to tell you it was a Disney ending, But it's not, because we fast forward a bit, and things are now a bit grim, you might say. Paul is in prison when he writes this letter. He's in chains. He's probably in Rome. This trial has already begun, but it's nowhere near done. So Paul is writing these words from a prison cell of some sort. He can't come and go like he could. He can't plant churches like he used to. And so things are grim from his perspective for sure. But... Timothy is also facing some grim sort of things as well. What's Timothy facing? He's supposed to be leading this church in Ephesus. He's supposed to be helping them, encourage them to continue to follow Christ, but things have gone off the rails, you might say. Things are not good. There's false teaching. There's arguments. There's some other things that are happening. And because of this, Timothy has come back in his shell, you might say. He's not doing what he's supposed to be doing. And the reason why Paul pens this letter is because Timothy is not doing what he's supposed to be doing. He's grown fearful. He's grown timid. And because of that, Paul pens the letter we have with us this morning. So continuing on then with verse 3, Paul continues to get even more personal. 
He says, Timothy, I thank God for you, the God I serve with a clear conscience, just as my ancestors did. Night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. I long to see you again, for I remember your tears as we parted, and I will be filled with joy when we are together again. So Timothy is told by Paul here some encouraging words. Don't you think he said some things about his own growing up? Like his ancestors played a significant role in his faith, and it was a Jewish faith growing up for, Tip, for Paul, right? He converts to Christianity later on. But his ancestors play a significant role in his faith. Then he says, I also remember you, Timothy, every single day, night and day, he says, right, in my prayers. Now that would have been encouraging for Timothy to hear that, right? Because when somebody says they're praying for us, doesn't that make us feel better? I know it does for me, and I think it would have felt the same way to Timothy. He remembers him regularly in his prayers. And then he says this, I also remember the last time we were together, the last day. Maybe there were some jokes, maybe there were some meals, but at the end of the day there was a hug, there was an embrace, and there were tears because they were parting ways. They were going in different directions. Timothy would be there and Paul would go there and Paul would get, eventually get arrested and now they are separated. But then Paul says, you know what though, I long for the time we come back together. There will be great joy. There will be more tears, but these will be tears of joy instead. So I remember these things. I think all this would have been powerful, impacting words for Timothy. Again, Paul is trying to convince and convict Timothy to do something. And here's what happened next. He has one more thing he says, I remember. Verse 5. He says, I remember, I remember your genuine faith. For you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I know that same faith continues strong in you. So maybe at some point Paul met Timothy's grandma. Maybe at some point Paul met his mom Eunice. Nevertheless, He brings their names up. He says, I remembered their faith. Now, what do we know about mothers in the first century? We know lots of things about mothers in the first century. We know that moms were in charge of the house. They really, really were. But even more than that, they were in charge with teaching their kids. And this teaching would have evolved into the spiritual life of their kids as well, to a point. There's some question about how much But they certainly did. And they certainly prepared their kids in the basics of of their faith. And Lois and Eunice would have prepared Timothy in the basics of his Christian faith. Preparing them to go to a synagogue. To go to the temple if they were Jewish, right? Or to go to the church if they're Christian. Preparing them in the basics of the faith is something women in the first century certainly, certainly did. So it's not... Surprising that Paul would bring up Lois in Eunice as he does here. And he brings them up and he offers them up as an example of the Christian faith. And like his ancestors, Timothy's ancestors, Lois and Eunice played a significant role. There's no mention of dad here, right? It's Lois and Eunice that offer the convincing and convicting words of the Christian faith that leads to the point where Paul describes Timothy's faith as a strong faith. That's pretty important, I think. Now, what do we know about the power of words? Words are powerful, aren't they? Like the words we speak to other people are so very powerful. There was a study done uh, several years back, and it was done by scientists. And these scientists did this experiment with two different groups of people. They gave these two groups of people Um, a series of words that were mixed together, and they were told to form sentences out of these words. Kind of like a game of Scrabble, right, in some sense. And so they're supposed to do this. But one group was a little different because the other group had, uh, this one group had other words that the other group didn't. And these other words were what we might simply call old age words, okay? So words like bald. Sorry for those of you who have bald 
uh, heads, younger people like, uh, but bald would be one description that they had. Um, Florida was another one associated with old age, right? Florida. Um, also, um, wrinkle, that was another one with a description of old age. So these sort of things. So there's different words with these two different groups. Does that make sense? And so they did this. They unscrambled things, made sentences, all that. But at that point, once they were finished, they were told to leave that room and walk down to the end of the hall. And that's really when the experiment began. Because as they left and walked down to the end of the hall to the other room, that's when the scientists started to time them. And guess what happened? The people with the old age words took longer to get there than the others. And they did this over and over and over again to verify it. So what do we learn from that? We learn that thoughts, soundtracks that are running in our heads do determine our actions, our activity level, and vice versa. It works the other way as well if you run it backwards. The words that are offered by Paul to Timothy, reminding him of his upbringing, reminding him of his Christian faith, reminding him how strong it once was, would have been so very, very important for Timothy to hear. And now when we move to verse 6, Paul wants to rewire Timothy's mind, offer him a brand new soundtrack so he can move forward once and for all. Look at verse 6. He says this, This is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift that God gave you when I laid my hands on you. Now, I don't know what the gift is that Paul's talking about. At some point, Paul had commissioned Timothy for service in the church, right? Had laid his hands on. And at some point, the Spirit of God came and gave Timothy a spiritual gift of some sort. Maybe it was leadership. Maybe it was teaching. Maybe it was preaching. Maybe it was administration. I don't know what it was. But he has this gift bestowed upon him. But clearly, because Paul says it here, he ain't using the gift, is he? And so Paul says to Timothy, rekindle that. Make use of that once more. Your faith was strong. Eunice and Lois made sure your faith was strong. You have a gift. You need to start using it. And then in verse 7, he ends with these words. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity. Clearly, this is the soundtrack that's running in Timothy's head, right? Fear and timidity. He's not fulfilling his duty. He's not leading the church well. And Paul says, God did not give you that kind of spirit. What kind of spirit did God give you? Here's the new soundtrack. And that new soundtrack is simply this. He gave you a spirit of power, right? Love, a sound mind, self-discipline, however you want to put it. He gave you that kind of spirit instead. So Paul imparts to Timothy a new soundtrack that needs to start playing soon so that he can get out of his shell and lead the church once Again, now, you and I have broken soundtracks just like Timothy does. In fact, we have probably many broken soundtracks that could be running through our head at any given time. And when we have more than one of these soundtracks running in our head, John Acuff calls these, he calls these pocket juries. And what he means by that is they're, they're small, like we can put them in our pockets, but they come out and they bite us at the most inopportune time. When we are going to do something good, something significant, these pocket juries rear their ugly head and they convict us of something that happened 20, 30 years ago, reminding us where we fell. So when we're about to train for a marathon, that pocket jury will come out and say, you can't do that. You don't got the time. You don't got the body. You don't got the stamina. You don't got the discipline. You can't do any of that. That's what the pocket jury does. It comes and rears its ugly head when we're about to write a book. 
that pocket jury will say, you can't even write an email, let alone a chapter in a book. You're not smart enough. You're not good enough. So that's what the pocket jury does on a regular single day, a regular basis. And I think all of us can kind of understand what that is and how it works. And it has absolutely devastating effects upon us. And if these pocket juries affect anyone more than any other group, I would have to say it's you moms that it affects the most. Think about all the things moms would never, ever say. In fact, I've got a video that shows just that. Let's watch this video next. I'm so bored. I wish I had something to do. <sighs> Thanks for letting me sleep in, kids. If you make a mess in the kitchen, please let me know so I can clean it up. Raising kids is so easy. I just love driving around all day. Oh, I never have to repeat myself. They always listen so carefully. Oh, look. An empty box of cereal. Love it. Just wipe it on your sleeve. It's pretty cold, but you don't need a coat. Oh, you don't have to push in your chair. Don't make your bed. You're just going to sleep in it again later. I think I'll skip the coffee today. You know, these throw pillows look way better on the floor. I'm really not that busy. Well, you haven't showered in three days, but I think you smell great. We do have food at home, but let's just go out to eat. Just brush your teeth whenever you feel like it. Here, take my phone charger and go put it in your room. Oh, just leave your dirty dishes on the counter. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, let's all pull out our phones. Youth sports are so cheap. Braces are so cheap. School fees are so cheap. Hey, can you come crawl in bed with me around 2 a.m.? Thanks. Okay, I just spent two hours making dinner, but if you don't like it, that's fine. Just let me know and I'll make you something else. Don't even bother looking for that. I'm sure it's lost and gone forever. Can somebody please throw something at my head? I mean, I can keep track of every single one of your things. I get a ton of sleep. I get a ton of gratitude from my children. I get a ton of unsolicited help with the housework. Oh, you don't have to hurry up. We're gonna be right on time. Can someone please throw something at the TV? Thanks for doing the laundry, everyone. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can you use your outside voice? Ah! Fight, fight, fight! Ah! The floor of this vehicle is so clean, I can't believe it. Oh, good. Another trip to the grocery store today. Let's go. Hey, I'm gonna hop in the shower. Does somebody wanna come use the bathroom while I'm in here? No mom has ever said any of that, right? Instead, most of you moms are running a soundtrack that says, you know what, I can't do it, I'm defeated, and at the end of the day, that soundtrack reminds you of how exhausted you are, right? And to you moms, let me offer a new soundtrack, one new soundtrack. There are many others, but here's one for you moms out there this morning. And that soundtrack is simply something like this. You moms are superheroes. You moms are superheroes. Now, you can't fly and, you know, go over tall buildings, that sort of thing. But you moms are the reason that every single one of us are here this morning, right? We wouldn't be here without our moms. And as someone who has witnessed six births firsthand, I can assure you that being a mom, giving birth takes incredible superhuman strength, you guys, doesn't it? Who have witnessed this firsthand. It takes incredible courage to go through that. And let me add this. It takes incredible patience for moms to have to deal with us guys who have absolutely no clue what they're going through, right? So it takes all of that. It takes superhuman strength to be a mom. No, you can't stop a speeding bullet, but I have seen you moms play superhero in the supermarket when you navigate through those aisles with four, five, six kids, make your way through the checkout lane, back to the car, back home, all without losing your mind, right? I've seen that. And as someone who has tried to take their kids shopping, it can be just an awful, awful experience. I took my daughters shopping last night for uh, Mother's Day, and um, they are uh, 15 and soon to be 17, and that was 
hard enough for me. Anyway, um, so you moms... Hear me out. You are superheroes. Now, maybe that doesn't work for you. Maybe you don't like that sort of outlook or that sort of soundtrack. But maybe you could say something like this. You know what? I'm a mom of four, and I'm crushing it today. Or I'm a grandma, and I'm one of the best grandmas around. That could be your new soundtrack, Jody. I'm one of the best grandmas around. Whatever it is for you, you can replace that old soundtrack that broken soundtrack that's running in your head with something far better. Now, we're not all moms here this morning. I get that. Some of you are grandfathers. Some of you are fathers. Some of you are aunts and uncles. Some of you are maybe teenagers. Maybe no teenagers in this group this morning. But nevertheless, we've got all sorts of people who also have broken soundtracks. I've already told you mine. What are some of yours? Well, we all have them. Again, we've mentioned things like, you know, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. All these kind of things that could be running in our heads as a broken soundtrack. Track. Uh, but nevertheless, here are some ideas of some new soundtracks that you could start to write instead. And so in the next slide, you'll see some of these new soundtracks. And here's one of them. Today is a brand new day and tomorrow is too. Today is brand new and tomorrow is too. That's a good soundtrack to have. I have a gift worth giving. That could be your soundtrack tomorrow. I have a gift worth giving. I'm the CEO of me and I'm the best boss. Some of you are CEOs of yourself and you are a pretty good boss. The best response to obstacles is just to do it anyway. But those of you who have run marathons like Michelle, that is a good one. The best response to obstacles, and there will be many, is just to do it anyway. Even though I don't like to run, I love how it makes me feel when I'm done. I don't know where the word feel went, but it's gone. But yeah, that's a good one to have, isn't it? Like that's how I feel when I'm done running or doing some sort of exercise like that. I hate it, but I love that feeling when I'm done. I will write that book three pages at a time. These are great new soundtracks that we can put into play on a regular basis, repeating ourselves to ourselves over and over and over again. Now, if those don't do it for you, I think even better soundtracks that we can run are biblical soundtracks. And there are many, but let me just give you a couple. For those of you who are worry warts, and I'm one of them, this is a great passage, isn't it? Philippians 4, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your heart and your mind as you live in Christ Jesus. What a great soundtrack to memorize and run through your head if worry is one of those things that just comes out and gets you on a regular basis. There were some other great ones in the songs we sang this morning, too. I don't know if you noticed some of those. I meant to write them down, but there were some great lines in there that would be great soundtracks. So we can find them in the Bible. We can find them in our worship songs. And there's one more biblical soundtrack that we can run. Those of you who are direction challenged, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding Seek God's will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Wow, what a great passage to have when we're questioning which way to go. Have we thought about turning it over to God instead? What a great soundtrack to run if you are direction challenged. And here's the thing, when we start to employ and use new soundtracks, here's what happens. Don't forget this. You change the soundtrack that's running in your head, you change your life. You change the soundtrack that's running in your head, you will change your life. You will. A Bible verse, a statement, whatever it might be, you will change your life. So my prayer, my hope is that you will start to write some new soundtracks even today. Grandmas, moms, dads, kids, whoever. We all can write some new soundtracks. Let me challenge you to do that this week. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for helping us 
to see just how important words can be, and especially the thoughts that run through our heads on a regular basis. And when these bad soundtracks, these broken soundtracks get run through our heads, we become like Timothy. We become timid and cowardly, and we don't do what we're supposed to be doing. And so God, remind us who we are in you. Remind us of these biblical passages that could become that new soundtrack for us even as soon as today. God, thank you for teaching us this valuable lesson this morning. Because when we change the soundtrack running in our heads, we absolutely can change our lives. Help each and every one of us to do that this morning and today and this week. Amen. All right, so our benediction today comes from the book of Revelation, if I can read. <laughs> Got my readers right here. No. Um, here's what it says as our benediction this morning. Got the wrong chapter open. There we go. <clears throat> I'm going to change up a minute. The writer of Revelation, John, says this. Grace and peace to you from the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come, from the sevenfold spirit before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, he is the faithful witness to these things, the first to rise from the dead, and the ruler of all the kings of the world. All glory to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by shedding his blood for us. He has made us a kingdom of priests for God his Father. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. Thank you guys for being here. You moms, grab a donut, please, on your way out. Enjoy that. Have a great, great day. We'll see you again next week.